Oh, there she is. Come to daddy. Didn't remember it being as heavy as this. <laughs> First thing to do is get rid of that. That's only for use on the tripod. Now that is the camera I lived with happily for nearly 20 years. Jealously guarded in my locker. Went round the world with these several times. And in my view, the best 16mm film camera ever. Uh, there were those who would dispute that. Some people preferred the Arri version of, of a self-blimp camera, but this was just, it was just built to be used. It's, it's, it's ergonomically superb. And uh, it's, you can just do anything you like with this camera. You can put it on a tripod and uh, add all sorts of bits on it, extension viewfinders, all sorts of stuff, and do you know, high-level high drama. But basically it came into its own when it was doing a lot of handheld, what they now call fly-on-the-wall, documentary style of stuff, because you could handle it so easily um, handheld in any direction you like. You could look at it down or up. Before we use the zoom a lot, I would use this with two, two lenses, usually a, a 12mm lens and a 25mm lens. And whilst the camera was actually running, you could quickly change the lens. And the little bit of film that ran while you were changing it, you'd always have a cutaway to get rid of it. So you keep the sync going without ever having to uh, stop the camera. Later on, we did it all with, with a zoom lens. Uh, but for a long time, I used the, the, the turret, mainly because the lenses were better and faster. If we were filming indoors, for example, without lights, these lenses, these prime lenses, were more suited to, uh, uh, to low light levels than the zooms were. So I was quite a long time, I was a bit reactionary about zoom lens. I preferred using prime lenses for quite a long time before I was beguiled into using a zoom lens. <laughs> This is what we call a displacement magazine, where the magazine sits on the top of the camera and as the, as the feed side gets smaller, the take-up side gets bigger. So it's dis that's displacing that, which keeps that fairly compact. But it's still a lot of weight on top of the camera, which is ergonomically not brilliant for hand-holding. The whole concept here is coaxial. So the feed side is there, and the take-up side is there and on the same axis, which means that the film has to take a rather odd path because it has to go through a little twist. To, but, it, but it means that the whole weight of the camera is, is snug and not perched on top, as cameras always had been up till then. And that's one of the things that transformed the use of this camera. So when this came out, it was like a miracle, basically. Plus it was designed, as you can plainly see, this is not the most comfortable camera in the world to hold, basically, as a hand-holding device. I mean, it is, it is comfortable, but it's not at all well balanced. Whereas, ah, this one, My memory is this weighs a ton. Yes. <laughs> this one, of course, was completely different because you could you could bring it back onto your shoulder, your shoulder yep. and work with it like this. More manageable. Yeah. So it was a better balance. And then when you moved, you could actually lift it off your shoulder so the body didn't transmit the vibrations into the camera. Especially as I'm not as young as I was. Unfortunately, um, but it is, I mean, it is a great camera. Well, there were all sorts of attachments, a bit like this. Um, one was for focus, so you could, you could control the focus by using this hand here. You could 
to revolve your focus. On this side I could operate the zoom, which is what the sound recorders was looking for. And on I had another one fitted here so that I could change the aperture if we went from exterior to interior all in one shot. And on the top here I had mounted, um, I mean what is a, a shoe like on top of most cameras, these stills cameras, and, and in that used to be an exposure meter so that I was complete without having to do anything, virtually without taking my hands off the camera. So I was basically designed it so that I could go anywhere at any time. With this at night, it's very low, you're very low key basically. Um, you know, you dress in dark clothes, you've got this. Um, you can hold it down Oh yeah, absolutely, you can hold it under your arm. Um, so it's, it was a great camera, much, great design. I mean, look at the difference. You could hardly be subtle with something like this, or this even. I mean, that was considered great in its day. But then when we got this, you suddenly felt a sense of freedom. You were very mobile. You know, you, for me anyway, I mean, I can't speak for other DPs, but, you know, I thought of my body as a kind of steady cam even before Steadicam came out on the market. It was being flexible, so it was going into the gym and building up this, you know, your upper body strength and your legs so that you were able to sort of just be as flexible as you can. Because, you know, if you go into a dangerous situation, you need to be alert as to what's going on around you. So it's learning to use your left eye as well as your right eye and being, you know, ready to move as fast as you possibly can. Um, and not be sort of held down with the equipment. I mean, part of this was, I mean, this is a conventional, oh, this was a conventional battery. You know, if you feel the weight of that, you've got this over your shoulder, which is fine. But then we designed what we called the battery belt. So we had a belt, all of that was in a belt, a leather belt around the, oh, there you are. Absolutely. So, you know, the difference between this and this was amazing you know this is throwing you off balance whereas here you know you this is all about is over your center of gravity oops I can't put it on because of the microphone <laughs> um, but you've got this around your waist so you know you're over the center of gravity still heavy oh yeah it's heavy yeah, but yeah. it's easy Same to carry way. it around no, it's, heavy, it? yeah. it's not going to throw you off balance yeah. We were filming a, a, a documentary in, in Sardinia about the Aga Khan, who was building a whole new holiday, holiday complex there called the Costa Smeralda. And we were due to do an actual interview with him. The day before that happened, we got a telex to say that, they, that uh, the studios were sending us out a new camera to, for us to evaluate. And it was the Eclair. We'd heard about the Eclair, but we hadn't seen one. So I had to take the morning off and go to the airport and collect these boxes and open it up and looked at this thing. I thought, what on earth is that? No instruction book, nothing. So I, I just had to, by trial and error, as I am now, because I've forgotten how you do it. No, I haven't. It comes back, doesn't it? Um, learn how to load the magazine. I might ask John to come in at this point. All right. <laughs> So you got it. That's the 16 mil film. Right, and it goes in that way round, I think. I think this is upside down. <laughs> I've got this upside down. It's amazing what you forget. Back in the early 70s, I was an assistant, and I did all the, all the loading of the magazines whilst David was, was shooting. What, what you should say is, is everything that we're doing now had to be done in the dark. So on location, that meant in, all done inside a black changing bag. And all this, you had to learn how to do this by braille, effectively. So that's all you do in the dark, that bit there. So the film's in there, and it's loaded onto the sprockets here. And inside there, as Dave said, that's where the, it, does a, it does a twist. So that it comes out here into the take-up side. Uh, it runs through. You'd pull, pull that through. You've got to be very adept at it. You could load magazines in a changing bag very quickly and you could change magazines very, very quickly. We always took, on average, well, the normal kit was three magazines. Each one's got 10 minutes of film in it. And 
as one was getting used up, the assistant would be loading, so we always had magazines to go. It was a hard job for the assistant to keep up uh, with loading the magazines if the camera was going non-stop. It did mean that the assistant was spent quite a lot of time with his hands in the changing bag, and if you needed him for other duties, like focus pulling, for example, uh, that could be a, sw a small problem. But I soon got the eclair, and then immediately after that, I became block crew on Man Alive, which was a very, very high profile um, current affairs documentary series, which purported to have, uh, be telling not just straight documentary, but fairly topical and always human. The whole idea was getting human emotion into these films, uh, which they did with various degrees of success. Um, but I, I did that program as a block crew, which is unusual. You're staying on the same program, because mostly at, at, at film department, BBC, we were all expected to do absolutely anything, panorama today and a drama tomorrow. But occasionally we did have block crewing, and I was block crew on Man Alive for two years, did nothing else except Man Alive, which I enjoyed enormously, really enormously, because I loved the people I was working with, and I liked the films we were making. And, and that's when I really pioneered my way of using this camera, because they were very much ahead of the game and wanted to, everything to be a discreet filming. Don't use a tripod unless you absolutely have to, and so on. And because I took to this camera so well, um, they seemed to think that they liked my style of doing things, so they hung on to me for two years. I really did enjoy it. It's under the direction of a marvellous man called Desmond Wilcox. On my first or second day there, and I met Desmond for the first time, he actually asked me to go and see him and talk to me about the, the philosophy and the culture of Man Alive. Yeah. And uh, I said, I, I know one thing about Man Alive, which is that we always zoom in on the tears. And he said, no, 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 no. We zoom out on the tears. That's what grabs people. Right, really? Yes. Yeah. He said, if you actually, if somebody starts to cry, if you just ease back just a little bit on the zoom, it shows how sensitive we are. Yeah. And people love it. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you a, a little odd anecdote about Man Alive, which is that we were once filming a, a documentary, a very typical Man Alive story, this, on death row in a Texas prison at a time when there was a moratorium on, on the death penalty. And there's all these people who are banged up in, in death cells and had been there for years, um, waiting to die. It was a pretty powerful story and a very sensitive one. But a wonderful um, uh, researcher, Cherry. Cherry. Oh, yeah, oh, Cherry. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Cherry. Anyway, uh, who'd set this, who'd been to America and got this, uh, managed to get all the permissions, which has never, never been done before, to actually film inmates in death row with a marvelous reporter called Dennis Chewy. And I remember him too, yeah. The first day we were in there, and there was a lot, we were getting a lot of bad reaction. It wasn't really working at all. We had to, we, we, we had a withdraw at five o'clock in the evening. We withdrew to the governor's office for a chat. And he said, they're all pretty pissed off. And we said, what's the problem? He said, well, they just don't like the, the name of the programme. Right. Of course, we were working with a clapperboard with Man Alive written all over it, and we're filming in death row. <laughs> and we, it never occurred to any of us at the time. I mean, why would you? <laughs> Yes. So we, had, we just had to change, we just took that off the clapperboard yeah. and, just, and just called it Texas Prison. And then they were quite happy. Yeah. <laughs>